apashitam atmatatvam Vriyashu Vriyamedinam Vriyashu Vriyamedinam Svatavyadini Rajendra Svatavyadini Rajendra Ninam Shanti Sahasra Saha Apashitam Atmatatvam Kriyeshu Kriya Mediyam Sarkabhadini Rajendra Nrinam Shanti Sahasra Saha Apashitam Atmatatvam Griheshu Griyamedinam Sotvavyadini Rajendra Ninam Shanti Sahasra Saha Apashitam Atmatatvam Griheshu Griyamedinam Sotvabhya Adini Subject matters for hearing Rajendra O Emperor Ninam Of human society Shanti There are So I mean, Sahasra Saha, Sahasra Saha, hundreds and thousands, hundreds and thousands, Apashyatam, Apashyatam, of the blind, of the blind, Atmatatvam, Atmatatvam, knowledge of self, knowledge of self, the ultimate truth, the ultimate truth, Griheshu, Griheshu, at home. Griha Medinam A person is too materially engrossed A person is too materially engrossed Translation, please repeat Those persons who are materially engrossed Those persons who are materially engrossed Being blind Being blind To the knowledge of ultimate truth To the knowledge of ultimate truth Have many subject matters have many subject matters for hearing in human society. For hearing in human society. O emperor. O emperor. Those persons who materially engross, being blind to the knowledge of ultimate truth, have many subject matters for hearing in human society. O emperor. Srila Prabhupada's divine purport. In the revealed scriptures, there are two nomenclatures for the householder's life. One is Grihasta, and the other is Grihamedi. The Grihasta, the Grihastas, plural, are those who live together with wife and children, but live transcendentally for realizing the ultimate truth. The Griya Medes, however, are those who live only for the benefit of the family members, extended or centralized, and thus are envious of others. The word Medi indicates jealousy of others. The Griamades, being interested in family affairs only, are certainly envious of others. Therefore, one Griamade is not on good terms with another Griamade, and in the extended form, one community, society, or nation is not on good terms with another counterpart. 
of selfish interest. Our nation is not on good terms with a never counterpart of selfish interest. In the age of Kali, all the householders are jealous of one another because they are blind to the knowledge of ultimate truth. They have many subject matters for hearing, political, scientific, social, economic, and so on. But due to a poor fund of knowledge, they set aside the question of the ultimate miseries of life, namely, miseries of birth, death, old age, and disease. Factually, the human life is meant for making an ultimate solution to birth, death, old age, and disease. But the Griamades, being illusioned by the material nature, forget everything about self-realization. The ultimate solution to the problems of life is to go back home, back to Godhead, and thus is stated in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 8, text 16. The miseries of material existence, birth, death, old age, and disease, or removed. The process of going back home, back to Godhead, is to hear about the Supreme Lord and His name, form, attributes, pastimes, paraphernalia, and variegatedness. Foolish people do not know this. They want to hear something about the name, form, etc. of everything temporary. And they do not know how to utilize this propensity of hearing for the ultimate good. Misguided as they are, they also create some false literatures about the name form, attributes, etc., of the ultimate truth. One should not, therefore, become a Griamate simply to exist for envying others. One should become a real householder in terms of the scriptural injunctions. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport to the second sloka or verse of the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the beautiful story of the personality of Godhead. Srila Prabhupada Kijan, I offer my humble and respectful obeisances to Srila Prabhupada because he has opened my eyes, which were certainly shut by the darkness of ignorance. When will Rupa Goswami Prabhupada, who has established within this material world the mission to fulfill the desire of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, give me shelter under his lotus feet? So it's our duty to propagate this message because, after all, all of our brothers and sisters, the whole world, are simply immersed in comic books and fiction, and uh, what to speak of the things they see as reality, which has everything to do with this temporary world, which all fades away at the time of death. Fades away even before that as we become sicker, and you know, no one can avoid it. For example, famous man in our country, President Ronald Reagan, loved by every Republican and respected as one of the greatest presidents amongst them. He also got Alzheimer's disease and they couldn't really let him come out in public. 
So, you know, it happens to everyone. You know, it's the inevitable, um, it, it, it's, you know, track or course, path of any human being. You know, no one can avoid it. You know, we may be a, the biggest health freak in the world, but, you know, down the line, you know, just like a car, you can, a car is a little bit easy to keep up. You know, because the parts can be so in, in, uh, inexchangeable. You know, it's just a machine without uh, a life soul in it. So, you know, there's no experience by the machine itself of pain and pleasure. You know, it doesn't have emotional problems or mental problems. It just has some mechanical problems. And you can take the carburetor out. They don't have those anymore. But, you know, you can take the whatever it is out put a new one in. Or take whatever sensor or computer is there and simply fix it. You know, you take, take the whole body and make it new. But a human being, it's a lot harder. You see the difficulties they have. They replace a knee. And, you know, people go through a lot of, you, you could call it trauma, just getting it to work again. You know, what to speak about when it doesn't work. I haven't heard where many knee surgeries haven't worked, but I have heard of hips and shoulders. Uh, 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 Longa Ganesha's sister is having a problem in Wyoming because a year ago she got some sort of shoulder replacement and the thing's like an inch off and she can't get them to fix it. It hurts like anything. Uh, Chichiketu, now Dundabats he calls himself, the guy who works in the kitchen at night. You know, his sister had a hip replacement. <laughs> and she's been worse off since before she went in. It just never, you know, uh, clicked. You know, sometimes comes out all right, sometimes not. There are, you know, and that's with any surgery. Uh, I, I had that picture of that gentleman here a few weeks ago, still in my office, Ram Chandra Mohanty. You know, big physicist in the state of Louisiana at LSU. You know, sits you know, with governors and presidents, even, uh, 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 not Gor yeah, Gorbachev from Russia came and, you know, uh, he welcomed him in New Orleans. You know, maybe a big prominent person goes in for surgery, something went wrong, got an infection, gone. Just like that. You know, it happens every day. Every day, you know, just like people are born every day, people are dying every day. It's just the course of human life. And it's not just human beings, it's everything in this material world. You know, the perfect example is the flower bud. You know what I mean? The flower, it buds, it jumps, new, and then it blossoms, and it's beautiful, and then it withers and dies. You know, that's just material life. But we're not... Uh, as a human being, when the soul gets a human life, you know, the soul is not like an animal, you know, with the speak of a car. You know, this body may be a machine, but the life in the machine is a person. And so consequently, this person perceives pain and pleasure. You know, he, that person perceives, uh, you know, feeling. You know, even the feelings of evidence. You know, the person has intelligence. They can figure out where to go. You know, they have a, a mind that uh, uh, the intelligence discriminates, but the mind is, you know, fluctuating between what to do. You know, what it likes, what it doesn't like. And the senses are the instruments for accomplishing things. You know, our eyes, our ears, our nose, you know, our sense of touch, etc. So, you know, because there's a soul there, there's a person. Otherwise, you know, the human body could be like a robot. I mean, you, you know, you could make it work through electronics, but it'd be a robot. You know, no real feeling. It only feed, feeds back what you put in it. You know, just like, you know, things may go well when you get an animated call. Or, you know, you're dealing with uh, Google on computer. Hey, Google, what about this? I don't know about that. 
Sometimes it doesn't know. And it really can't, you know, you can play with it, but same with human being, may not know, but it's a, it's a soul that you're dealing with. You know, it's a person who has some a life beyond his body. So it may seem like just an ordinary human being, you know, just a, a coolie. They call him a coolie in India. Be like a real, you know, I hate to use the word, but low-class laborer. You know, all they can do is just carry things for people. You know, so... But that soul in that body has a life beyond that body. You know, we don't know where that, per that soul, that person came from. And neither do we know where they're going. So, you know, one may offend the coolie, but they don't know who they're offending. Can't offend people just because of their social status. So, uh, you know, a, a person is, is different than uh, just a machine. You know, so, you know, we're different from just this body, and this body is a very complicated thing, even with all our modern technology, you know, it's so difficult to operate upon. You know, we just can't keep it running forever like a car. And the car won't run forever if some human being doesn't fix it. You just leave it sit there and see what it looks like 10 years down the line. You know, rodents have gotten in there, they've eaten away at the wires. You know, anything you let sit in this material world without some person maintaining it, it just rusts, fades away. So, you know, human life is very special because unlike the animal, we can consider things philosophically. Animals don't think like that. They think, you know, where's the bread? Where's the food? You know, I got, got to make my home. Uh, got to take care of the kith and kin, whatever you know, way that is for that particular animal. Sometimes it may mean eating the baby. For an animal, they do that sometimes. Uh, uh, you know, eating, mating, sleeping, and they have to defend themselves. You know, you back any animal into a corner and it's going to defend itself. You know, it's just nature. So human beings have that capacity too, except we do it very sophisticatedly. You know, we sleep in a big house, in a big comfortable bed, you know. I mean, you know, the sleeping industry is a huge industry. These bids that they put out, you know, they go up and down, they change heat. You know, they do all kinds of things, you know, do it on each side. You know, so we may be able to sleep very sophisticatedly, but after all, it's sleeping. And nowadays, people have a problem doing that. Mm -hmm. They may have all kinds of money to buy the best bed, and they still can't sleep. They got to take so many pills to sleep, and then, you know, those pills, you know, they have their reactions. God, you can lie, you know. So, you know, we can sleep, and we can also mate, but I mean, what's the difference between our mating and an animal's mating? Now, animals are more equipped than us. What human being can keep up with a chimpanzee, a pigeon, or a rabbit? We don't even have that capacity. You know, because, you know, after all, we're a human being. And the special feature about us is the thing called the brain. You know, we can think in sophisticated ways, whereas the animal, you know, they have their special features. No one can, you know, a hawk can see a rodent from way up in the sky and swoop down and get its prey. You know, human being, our senses on our eyes aren't that great. Neither is our nose, you know, would I speak of a bloodhound. I mean, they perceive the world in a different way. You know, they can sense fear. They can sense emotion. I mean, it's said, I don't know, I can't scientifically, I've never read a scientific study on it, but it's said that a cat can see goats. I don't know. But I, I do know that they have a sense of balance like we don't have. Just throw one out of a, you know, a, a, a second story window and see how it lands. 
You know, that, well, as a human being, I mean, you know, it's going to freak us out. You know, unless one is extremely practiced in uh, the sense of balance. So, you know, a human being, we can educate ourselves to do things that almost appear supernatural because, you know, without that education, people don't normally act like that. Uh, but we can only get so much out of the body. You know, we may train our eyes, we may put on night goggles, we may look through telescopes and microscopes, but, you know, our, our vision is limited. It's limited. So the special feature of the human being is that we can think philosophically and we can start to figure out, you know, the situation. You know, why are we, why do creatures suffer in this world? I mean, is, is this world just meant for suffering? Or is there something we can really do about it? And then we can also see, and we can also see not only bad people, but saintly people. And we can see why are they meditating? Why are they reading what they're reading? Who are they praising? Who are they uh, talking about? I mean, why aren't they just reading, uh, you know, this fiction writer, that fiction writer, you know, looking at this television program, that television program, this Netflix thing, that Netflix thing. You know, why are they doing something different? And why are they just reading, you know, those ancient books? And, you know, books about it that have been elaborated upon by, uh, by people who think solely about that uh, philosophy or theology. You know, they can see that, and they can, uh, they can even inquire from them. And, and that person would, would say, because, uh, you know, we have a home beyond this world where, you know, there is no suffering. I mean, uh, quite commonly said in every religion. Everybody's heard that, you know, in a, in a country like ours where religion can compete with all the other advertising industries, you know, and tell people that, you know, you are meant to go back home to God here. Whereas the rest of the advertisement industry is telling us, you know, eat this and you're going to be uh, strong, or, or, you know, uh, Put that on, and boy, all the others are going to really be attracted to you. You know, they tell us stuff like that all the time, you know. It's just concerned with things in this world. But, you know, the religious people are saying, pray here, and, you know, and you're going to be saved. From what? Well, from, you know, from death, what happens at death. Nobody, they don't, people don't know. I mean, you know, even the, the big scholastic people don't know. They tell you, go to church. You know, that's not our field. You know, it's a faith. Nobody knows. But is it, does it have to be a blonde faith? <laughs> does your faith just have to be blonde in the sense that, you know, you were brought up with this faith and, you know, you appreciate the persons <coughs> who shared it and, and, you know, and it's, it's done wonders for you. So you have some faith, but do you have vision? I mean, can your intelligence really perceive it? Do you have a spiritual experience of, you know, that spiritual meaning that, you know, it's beyond this world? That, I mean, you know, you actually met the person on the other side or you saw the other side. Like sometimes people have these death experiences and occasionally they'll document that one famous one on YouTube where this doctor big PhD doctor, he uh, documented how he went to this really celestial type of world, you know, and how but he was eventually sent back. Uh, it sounded like, you know, the celestial planets. So uh, there's many things like that out there. And, you know, and what to speak of all the documentation of near-death experiences. Uh, so, I mean, I mean most people don't have that uh, experience. I mean, naturally, you have some experience like that, it changes your, most people's lives. And they, you know, they start to think in those terms rather than think in the terms that they thought before. So, 
animal can't do that. A dog will only think as a dog. Now, a dog may be very loyal, and he may have ever have good qualities. You know, you wake up a sleeping dog, and he can immediately act. Human being, I mean, we may be drowsy. What are you doing? You know, give me a half an hour to get it together. <laughs> Not dog. You know, dog's gonna hop on up, and what's going on? He's gonna be ready, ready to take action immediately. Or like a rooster, bold like a rooster. You know, rooster. You know, rooster is not a chicken. You know, rooster is going to fight. You know, bold like a rooster. And so I mean, uh, they you know animals have good qualities. Other creatures have good qualities, but they don't have the thinking capacity of a human being. And you know, we're blessed with that to understand life. And life isn't just what we see in this world, being able to breathe, and when all of a sudden the breath is gone and you do CPR and, and all that other stuff and shock the heart and, and it just doesn't come back, then the person's declared dead. The person's gone. You know, what was the difference, though, between that body a few minutes before when it was living and that body when it's dead? What is the difference? They haven't been able to figure it out. You know, the consciousness is gone, no longer has consciousness, but 10 minutes before it had consciousness. Same chemicals, but for whatever reason, the body stopped functioning. Of course, you know, they can say that the heart stopped beating, but they can keep the heart beating. Then they call it brain dead. Why is the brain dead? You know, so, uh, you know, what is gone? What's the difference? We say, the Bhagavatam says, the Bhagavad Gita says, most religious scriptures say, the soul is gone. Even the Buddhists say, the soul is gone. You know, they have their difference in philosophy, but still they say that as long as the soul is in the material world, it transmigrates from body to body. The soul is gone. Body is like a car now, it's just a machine, but that car's going to deteriorate a lot quicker than metal. The bones may still be there, but all that flesh and blood is going to be gone in 10 days or less, you know, depending on what creatures eat it, you know, how quickly it decomposes. Whether you've got some family members that are going to come and bury it or burn it. So, uh, Human, human life, you know, we can begin to perceive that, that I'm something beyond this body and that, you know, life is meant for understanding these things. Uh, you know, what happens at the time of death? You know, can I, what is the ultimate truth? You know, can I perceive it? How can I perceive it? Uh, you know, let me take the opportunity to perceive it. You know, let me at least take 10 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour, an hour, a whole day to hear something other than all about the temporary things in this world that you can hear on any computer, any cell phone, you know, any television, any book, newspaper, magazine, it's all about the things in this world. Any Big educational institution, whether it be Harvard, you know, uh, UCLA, or you know, USC, whatever it be, USM, LSU, doesn't matter. It's all about this world. Maybe very sophisticated, but it's all about this world. And of course, we can go to divinity school, some you know, theological. We you know, we can go to the yoga studio and start to try to get a glimpse beyond this world. You know, a glimpse of our soul, so to speak. That's the terminology we use in this part of the world. In India, they would say the Atma. The Atma, the self. And it, it works. It works. There's the possibility of getting a spiritual experience. You know, without having to have an extraordinary death experience. You know, they, they, they all have some process one can follow. 
to gain some spiritual experience. So similarly, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness isn't something new that just invented something out of the the, the, uh, the fertile brain of a uh, human being. No, it's knowledge that's been passed down from generation to generation since the beginning of the universe. Um, elaborated upon recently because after all the universe gets old and you know if Krishna doesn't update it just like a computer it gets old if you don't update it you don't update the program just like they just shut down our website because the word processing wasn't updated I don't know what they call it, word processing word something that word press. word press it wasn't updated it was too old they're afraid hackers are going to get in and you know cause problems all over you know, for the, for the host, with the speaker just does. So, you know, they force you, they take it down and say, hey, you got to update. So Krishna has to update in this world because things become lost, you know. He has to update. So that's how Krishna consciousness movement is, besides being old, you know, coming along with the universe, God gives the Vedas, you know, when he gives the universe. I mean, even in the Christian Bible, which is written by the Hebrews, you know, it said that, you know, uh, in the beginning was the Word. So what is the Word? The Word is God's Word. So uh, the Vedas come along. The Vedas are the Word. Veda means knowledge in uh, Sanskrit. That means mother language. You know, you can trace all languages back to Sanskrit. I, I know there's ling linguistics that will argue about that, but just about any of them will say it's a very sophisticated, phonetically perfect language. Uh, you know, every bit as good as Latin and Greek and Arabic or whatever else you have. It's, and it's, uh, even its critics will have that to say. So, um, to update the Vedas for human beings in our day and time, uh, the Lord appeared just 500 years ago. And he did not appear like Krishna appeared. Because when Krishna appeared, whenever God incarnates, practically speaking, in general, he incarnates into human families when he appears in human society. Because he can also appear in the societies of celestial beings, into the, all sorts of societies in this universe. The universe is very vast. It's not like we present it as human beings, like mainstream human beings present it. That, you know, it's basically, you know, we're the most intelligent creatures that have involved, evolved. It's not really like that. There are many societies of very intelligent creatures who can do all sorts of things. So, uh, uh, Krishna, when he incarnates, he generally appears amongst the leaders of human society. There are leaders, and those leaders are commonly the uh, administrators, the governors of human society. Those persons who have the leadership capability to influence and lead others. That when, when, when at any time, people will follow them because, you know, they're, they're hitting the shoulder above that. You know, they're the best of the lot, so to speak. And, and not only that, not, gen it's almost generally nowadays, but uh, it should be, and it has been in previous ages, and you can see it today. They also have the heart to protect evidence. They're only looking out for the welfare of evidence. You know, they, have, they use their courage to help others, not to harm others. So, you know, that's the type of people Krishna appears amongst. Because after all, he's like that. You know, he has the heart to always help others and not harm others. And or he will appear amongst the teachers of society. Those people are the people that can guide society. They're, they're often compared to the head of society. You know, the 
He had God's society. The head can see, the head can hear, the head can think. You know, if you take the head away, the body's useless practically. But the head cannot protect the body. Generally speaking, it can try, try to do something, you know, but it's practically useless, you know. But the arms can protect. So the arms are compared to those leaders. They can protect society, whereas the head can guide society. So that's your teachers in society. All over the world it's like that. You can try to say, we're going to have a classless society, but you can't have a classless society because they're different categories of people. Mm -hmm. And you can't make a teacher a warrior. And nor can you make a warrior a teacher because people are going to get tired of... Uh, the way he teaches, generally speaking, he, he would have to have some teaching attributes. Otherwise, just his leadership may make him an administrator of a school, but not necessarily the best English teacher or whatever teacher he got. It may make him the head coach, but not necessarily the coach of this and the coach of that, because one has to have the patience and the ability to transmit knowledge and, to, and for people to... Uh, you know, want to learn from them and not be put off or simply learn out of fear or whatever, you know. So teachers, Krishna appears amongst teachers. So when Krishna appeared just 5,000 years ago, is the famous Krishna who spoke Bhagavad Gita, he appeared amongst the warriors and no warrior could compete with him because after all, he's God. So he exhibits his godliness amongst the human beings and can fight with whomever wants to fight, you know, including you know, vast armies of other people, single-handedly. But when uh, Krishna appeared 500 years ago, he appeared amongst the teachers. Teachers fight in a different way. It's called words. They debate subject matters. You know, and, and the one who has the, uh, the best evidence is, uh, you know, and can present it in the most logical way, you know, they generally win. So Lord Chaitanya appeared amongst the teachers of society, and he was the foremost scholar in human society until he became a devotee. Because he, after all, he was not playing as a devotee. He appeared in a devotional family. And, you know, he knew the importance of worshiping God, but his thing was scholastics. And no one could compete with him. No one could make an argument that could in any way that, uh, 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 trap him or to, uh, uh, that he couldn't, he couldn't meet the challenge of anyone's of some, someone else's argument. He could always meet the challenge and then dismiss the challenge and just befuddle and bewilder the other person by his ability to defeat their argument and then turn around and defeat his own argument and then turn around and defeat them all again or prove the original and, or prove that the person's original argument was actually the correct argument. So people would just become confused ultimately because of his great ability. But down the line, it didn't become important. Because it mainly had things to do in this world. It was just logic and argument. You know, after all, there's something more than that. And he fell in love. Not with his spouse. That, you know, happens naturally also, but you know, it's more of a, a duty and a, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, take care of another and to uh, uh, propagate the race, so to speak, and to, uh, uh, to fulfill our needs. But uh, he fell in love unconditionally for another person. Uh, that completely 
in Hammett and changed his life and life was never the same. And that person was himself, not, not in a selfish way, because when Krishna appeared as Lord Chaitanya 500 years ago in the family of teachers, he didn't expose himself as God. He played like a human being. And when he became a devotee, he played like a devotee. He never presented himself as God, so he was teaching us to act, uh, to be a devotee. And he was showing us how to be a devotee. So he also, when I say he fell in love with himself, that's because he's Krishna. But he didn't, nobody could know that, so he fell in love with Krishna. Not himself as Lord Chaitanya, he fell in love with the Krishna that appeared 5,000 years ago and spoke Bhagavad Gita. It's the same Krishna that the Bhagavatam is all about that teaches us how Krishna created the material world. You know, how he breathed out the universes, how he enters every universe, how he uh, uh, stays within the universe and expands within the heart of every creature, how he takes different incarnations throughout time and different places the Bhagavatam teaches all this and Lord Ch so Lord Chaitanya uh, he he also taught that he fell in love with that Krishna and for him the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavatam was all that life was about he never bothered with any other scripture again his students at first, were confused when he <clears throat> became a full-fledged devotee because his teachings all of a sudden changed. Now everything he taught, he taught from the perspective of Krishna. And so they got tired of hearing Krishna. You know, Krishna this, Krishna that. You know, we're just trying to learn Sanskrit grammar. You know, why do you have to explain everything according to Krishna? Finally, Lord Chaitanya dismissed him. He said, look, he said, I've fallen in love with Krishna. That's all I see day and night is Krishna. Uh, you know, therefore, you know, I can't teach you anymore like you want to be taught. So you just go somewhere else, wherever you want, you have my permission. And all of them said, no, after spending just 10 days with you, we also don't want anything but Krishna. We won't go anywhere else. You know, we'll always be your students. And so, you know, that was the beginning of his Sankirtan movement. No longer was he interested in just scholastics and being the top-notch scholar, you know, within uh, his school and within his neighborhood and community and district and state and country and world. That wasn't important to him anymore, to have... Because, you know, as a human being in this material world, you know, we're, we have different professions. But when he became Lord Chaitanya, he completely renounced the world. It no longer had any importance to him. He was still married. His wife would come sit before him. And it was like he would just be looking through her. Because all he could see was Krishna now. She was such a great soul that when he socially renounced the world, she was young and she lived alone with his mother. He renounced his mother and young wife before having any children to take care of them because the world was in such a difficult situation. And in his situation, people just criticized him for now becoming a full-fledged devotee. And he thought, how can I help these people when now they're going to turn around and criticize me? And that providence is going to consider a great offense because after all, I am Krishna. And, you know, here they are, they're, they're offending me. They don't want to take any lessons from me. They think I'm a wacko, you know, so... What can I do? So, 
what he did was, I'm trying to think of a comparison in this world. It would be almost like Donald Trump. I'm a wacko, I'm not saying he's a wacko, but I'm saying, let me run for president. And if I'm elected, everyone has to respect me or the Secret Service is gonna show up at their door. So what Lord Chaitanya did, he didn't become the king. Because after all, he was born in a family of teachers, not, not administrators. What he did was, in Vedic culture, they have two other orders of life besides people being students and being married. One's called retired. We used to that in this world. We all retire, but we generally retire, you know, to kick back and do what we wanted to do, you know, as our hobby and instead of working all the time to put, make, make ends meet, you know, put bread on the table, so to speak. That's what we think of as retirement. But in Native culture, retirement means that, that one is now going to be sexually disconnected and they're going to um, simply focus the mind on uh, Vedic Shastra or Vedic knowledge to understand life and God. And uh, they're going to visit other places and talk to sadhus and try to make their devotion, their devotion, their service to God uh, as perfect as possible. They're going to try to, they're going to try to hone their expertise in devotional service. You know, instead of not having time to study, they're going to study. And they're going to learn so many verses. And they're going to do all the things that they really couldn't do, that maybe if they were fortunate enough to be a student of, with this culture, then all the things that they had to sort of uh, not participate in as much when they became family people, they were, now they're going to participate in that again. So that's how Vedic retired life is. It's, it's a spiritual dimension, not just, I, just, they retire from material life, but they don't kick back and enjoy a sense gratification. They, the, object, the, the goal is to renounce sense gratification because sense gratification is keeping us in this world. It makes us attached to this world. I like just eating, sleeping, mating, and I'm ready to defend myself anytime. People like that. You know, they go to karate school, whatever school, to be ready to defend. People pride themselves on the ability to defend. I mean, nowadays we walk around with guns to defend. Again, it's like the Wild West. It had gotten away from it to some degree, but now again, people walk around with their gun on the side of their hip because they're ready to defend. They're proud that I'll defend if anybody causes any problem around here, I'm going to blow their head off. They, to a lesser or greater degree, they think like that. But to speak about when you mix alcohol with it, you know. <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, these things keep us in the material world. So we have to renounce it. But, you know, how can you renounce your life here if you don't have a life somewhere else? So we have to become attached to the spiritual life. And spiritual life doesn't mean just nothing. But, you know, it just means some kind of light. I mean, how do you become just attached to light? You know, it has to be life in the light. So, you know, we become attached to spiritual people. You know, to spiritual things. Just like we've attached to material things. And the intriguing thing is that when one's education is perfect, you can take the material things and turn them into spiritual things. So the same old car that was just used for material things can be used for Krishna's purpose. I mean, Prabhupada used to say uh, 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 that, you know, he flies all over the globe. And sometimes people would say, um, you know, why don't you just use mystic power? 
He said, why? You know, whatever mystics do, scientists can do. I can fly all over the globe. Why do I need to use mystic power? I can go to this place, that place. You know, nowadays, you know, we can talk on the other side of the globe. You know, just by clicking. You know, by Skype or whatever. Talk on the other side of the globe. You know, they can, this whole thing that I'm doing here can be seen in India, Malaysia, Thailand, Japan, wherever. Just like that, instantly. You know, where's the need of mystic power? So, you know, that we can take things that are materially material and use them spiritual. Just like eating. We eat, don't we? We're still eating. But, you know, the food has been offered to Krishna with love and devotion. It becomes different. You know, it has a, a different effect on the consciousness. It may not just make us physically strong, but it may make us spiritually strong. So there's also another order of life besides this retired life. And Lord Chaitanya did that. In, in Vedic culture, it's called sannyas. That means one has become civilly dead. It's just like a dead man materially. They leave their family. No longer do they have a family. The world becomes their family. And they don't have a home. The sky becomes their roof, and the ground becomes their floor. And they simply traverse the world, uh, appreciating, teaching the uh, Vedic knowledge, the glories of Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They have no other purpose in life, they're renounced. They would never think about going back to sense gratification. For them, it would be like eating their vomit. Then generally, these are people that are older, that have passed through different stages of life, have you know, valuable experience of life, and they're prepared to do this. They have the psyche for it. But Lord Chaitanya was only 24 years old. But he's God, you know, he's God, so he can manage to do these things. Uh, the world, you know, just what was going to happen, you know, people just couldn't appreciate, you know, love of God that he was exhibiting, and he couldn't help but exhibit love of God on the greatest stages, because he's, he's God. So he, when he starts to exhibit love for God, then he exhibits it like his greatest devotees exhibit it. So Krishna's greatest devotee is his eternal consort, Radharani. So Radharani's love for Krishna is so great, we can't imagine it. So Lord Chaitanya, when he wants to experience love of himself and love for Krishna, he experiences it like Radharani. So people can't understand that. It looks, it looks extraordinary. I mean, when Lord Chaitanya would cry for Krishna, it could water a garden. And people don't cry like that. When he would, uh, when he would uh, laugh, you know, people don't laugh like that. People would think he was mad. So he had to think of something because he wasn't going to be able to teach them because they wasn't going to respect him. So he took sannyas. He left his wife and uh, mother in charge of his devotees there. He, you know, they had to take care of them. And that meant that now he was renounced completely from the world, shaved off his hair, took initiation from an ever sannyasi and simply traveled the world with one piece of cloth, piece of underwear, a bagging bowl, and a staff 
that show that his body, mind, and words were now completely devoted to God and he had no other interest. And he did that for 24 years before disappearing from the planet. And now people, because it's the culture, it's just like, it's just like President Trump. You may not like President Trump, but if he shows up, you can't spit in his face. Oh, you know you're going to have a problem. Because he's the president. So similarly in Vedic culture, it's like that among spiritual beings. It may not be like that in our country. Still, if the Pope shows up, everybody treats him respectfully. But he's certainly going to have his critics that are going to write all sorts of mean things about him. And even Trump, they do that, but still they have to be careful not to threaten him in any way. Because he's the president. It's against the law to threaten the president. And he's got a whole secret service to make sure that nobody does that. And believe me, it, 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 it acts. It does act. You may, you may think I'm just a conspiratorial guy, but uh, we had a guy here. He was a former Korean War veteran, and he didn't like the way uh, the, uh, one congressman was doing things. And he spoke in such a way that they felt threatened. And believe me or not, the Secret Service knocked on his door. They came to Picayune, Mississippi. They asked to see me in a Walmart parking lot and invited me over to the Picayune police station and told me what was on their mind. I answered their questions and they went and knocked on his door. Secret Service, FBI, and... Uh, Picking in the police. So don't think they don't act. Don't think that, you know, that, so I mean, you, you have to show respect to the, to the president to some degree, you know. So in, in Vedic culture, and you, even, you see this even in Buddhist culture amongst the Thai people. If a person is wearing orange and is a monk, everybody respects them and they give them some food or money clothing, and they show respect to them. So in Lord Chaitanya's society, everyone by training respected a sannyasi. You would in no way say anything to offend them, you would humble yourself, you would bow before them, even if you didn't understand their idiosyncrasies. So in that way, Lord Chaitanya could now teach because everybody was forced to respect him because of his order of life. Even though he was young, he was a sannyasi. And he could exhibit love of God to the infinite degree and people would uh, not be able to criticize him. They could only think, wow, look at this sannyasi. He is definitely not in this world. So, and, you know, to read the, the uh, pastimes of Lord Chaitanya, how he made people Krishna conscious is just amazing. Even the most common people. Like one time, him and his disciples were going uh, someplace, and, and, you know, he had to go through like a toll booth. So the tax collector there, you know, restricted them. And Lord Chaitanya didn't have no money. But, you know, he, he could see he was different. And when he talked to him, you know, he found it. He said, look, I'm going to let you go, but I'm not letting anybody else go. So Lord Chaitanya went. I mean, he was just, you know, in another world. He went, and then he sat down, you know, so many 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet from the guy. I don't know how far. I can't remember what the text said. But all of a sudden, he started crying and calling out to Krishna. And the tax collector became so affected by hearing him that he began to cry. He said, who is this person? And they said, he is our master. His you know, disciple that he wouldn't let pass. He said, he is our master. He is Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he's teaching love of God. The guy immediately went and touched his feet, fell at his feet and surrendered to him and, and let all of his disciples pass. 
and you know, just begging for his blessings. So in that way, people just seeing Lord Chaitanya became devotees. Just hearing him, they became devotees. And when they went home to their houses, their families became devotees. Just seeing them. In fact, the whole village became a devotee. Just seeing a person who had seen Lord Chaitanya became devotees. What TV evangelist wouldn't want that kind of shakti or spiritual potency? So that was his pastime in this world. Krishna fought with demoniac kings. But Lord Chaitanya made everyone a devotee. That's why we can also use the same phrase for him that we use in the Christian world, the Prince of Peace. Because he didn't fight with anybody, although his country and his people were the subjects of a Muslim regime that persecuted them. He didn't create an uh, insurgency. I think that's how you pronounce it, or re, yeah, insurgency. He didn't create that. He didn't become a political person. That's the king's duty. He simply taught everyone and he wasn't afraid of anyone. The Muslims would become a devotee when they saw him. Sometimes the devotees were afraid and they would be threatened by their critics. That all you do is chant so loudly. Don't you know what's going to happen, you fool and rascal? You're ruining the village. The Muslim king is going to come here for you practicing your so-called Hinduism openly like this and they're going to destroy the whole village. It's better we get rid of you for loudly chanting like this. That's what they would say. So Lord Chaitanya would come and he would say, don't be afraid. What is that king going to do? If he comes, then I'll tell him within his heart not to do this. And if he doesn't listen, then I'll go to his court and I will tell him to bring all of his mullahs. And I will say, now let me see you make the king cry for love for Allah. And he'll let them do what they can do. And he said, now let me make the king cry for love of Allah. He said, that's what I'll do. And so in this way, his devotees were fearless, despite living within a Muslim regime. Even one time he, was, he, he went, some, went next to the big palace of the governor. And the governor questioned, who is this person? So he had one Hindu... Uh, minister. So the Hindu minister didn't want to cause trouble for Lord Chaitanya. So he said, ah, he's nobody. He's just a poor mendicant. You know, you don't have to worry about him. And the governor thought, he said, you're wrong. If I don't pay my people for six months, I have a revolution on my hands. This guy doesn't pay anyone. And yet people give up everything. They just follow him. He said, I don't have that kind of influence. So he thought and he said, he listened to someone else describe the qualities of Lord Chaitanya. And then he said, he issued an order. No one is to disturb this Lord Chaitanya. You let him do as he pleases and you let him go where he wants. And anyone who causes him any trouble will immediately be charged by me. So, in this way, Lord Chaitanya spread love of Godhead all over Bengal and eventually all over India. You know, as, it, as the West was having a sort of geographical or political uh, evolution in the 14 and 1500s, you know, we were traveling all over the world and quote unquote colonial now colonial colonial Ozing it. I think that's how it's pronounced. You know about imperialistic philosophy? Huh? Colonizing. Colonizing it. Yeah, right. Thank you. Colonizing it. Uh, and India was different. They were, they were colonizing India too. But uh, Lord Chaitanya was uh, there was a great theistic revolution. 
very uh, ever powerful contemporaries appeared along with Lord Chaitanya, like Guru Nanak, who formed the uh, Sikh religion in India, tried to merge uh, Hinduism and Islam by uh, putting the concentration on chanting God's names in the name of Ram, the name of Krishna, but without a deity, since that's the most difficult thing for the Muslims to digest. And they would persecute the Hindus because of that. Uh, so, but it didn't work. They, they, the Sikhs became persecuted too. But they were, they were pretty powerful. Many of them were from Khatriya warrior backgrounds. And so they, they were able to establish an empire there in the Punjab where Pakistan is today. But eventually the, the British conquered them. And mainly the British did it not only with uh, Western weapons and uh, their own soldiers, but uh, with um, mainly mercenaries. Not just because I've described it before in class how you know, India was a, a place that there was this constant fighting to control different territories because it was all civilized and people naturally paid taxes to governments. So everybody would fight for control to, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a place to gain the revenue. And they would simply hire mercenaries as soldiers and pay them money. In fact, the whole Muslim regime, if you think the United States budget is wacko because 60% or 40% of it goes into the military, and therefore, consequently, our people still don't have, <laughs> still don't have uh, health care for everyone. I mean, in every other developed country, you just go to a doctor, you know, you don't worry about, you can't afford it. You go to a doctor. You know, the state blesses the people with that in a developed country. You know, everybody can go to a doctor. You don't have to worry about it. My daughter doesn't have to worry about not having insurance. So she can't go to the doctor even though she's got problems because she can't afford it. And they even want to cut off her daughters because they make so much money. And they still live in poverty level in a mobile home. But yet they have to worry about these things in a developed country to go to a doctor. It's because we have to police the world with our military. So uh, the Muslim budget, 90% of it went into the military. Not to the roads, not to things for the people, simply to suppress the people or to, you know, conquer more territory. It's like a police state. It all went to pay off the soldiers. They would first pay off the generals because you don't want to lose the support of a general because the general controls the army. He has his own army. So you pay that general, he pays his people. And so most of their budget went into maintaining these huge forces. That's documented. In their own books, it's documented. So that's, you know, material world. You know, Lord Chaitanya, you know, he, he wasn't afraid of any of that. He wasn't even afraid when on one side of the river was a, Hin a Muslim government and on the other side was a Hindu government. And they're virtually at war because at any time the Muslims could cross that river and attack. And your whole culture is gone. And so the Muslims also worried about the Hindus crossing the river and attacking. So there's spies on both sides of the river and everybody's afraid to go down the river because everybody, one side and the other is going to grab them and accuse them of supporting the other side. So nobody would travel. Lord Chaitanya just went down the river and he made everybody chant loudly. And so the boatman's thinking, oh my God, this is going to be the last trip I make down the river. And he says, if, and if we pull over and hide, the tigers are going to get us. So he told that to the devotees chanting. He said, look, you know, we're going to be, be bait for the tigers or for the pirates on this river or for the different soldiers. He said, please don't chant so loudly. It's night, you know. We're going down the river. No one can see us. When they stopped chanting, Lord Chaitanya said, what is going on? Why are you afraid? 
I said, chant. Don't worry. Don't you think Krishna's in control? Just chant. And so they did, and of course they made it. Now he's Lord Chaitanya. Uh, you know, I can tell you stories of contempt you know, modern devotees where that worked, but then there's also those cases where it didn't. There's one lady uh, who was uh, in Africa and somehow ever she had the guts to challenge. She made friends with one you know, warlord who was in control of, I forget what country it was in. And uh, that was fine. But then when she began to preach, and you know, sometimes our preaching gets mixed with politics, she would preach against, and to his mind, it was against what he was doing. And you know, instead of being a little bit maybe diplomatic, you know, she fearlessly went on preaching. And it may not have been just to chant Krishna's names. I mean, like I said, it may have been mixed with some politics, like uh, maybe she was telling uh, him to, uh, you know, put down the guns or, uh, you know, to make friends with his enemies or, you know, something like that, you know. So and he, uh, you know, he shot her and all of her people right on the bank of a river and walked away. So, I mean, you know, things like that certainly happen, you know, I mean, it is the material world. So we have to be prepared to go back home to Godhead at any time. You know, generally speaking, these things happen when we're young through accidents, mainly car accidents. So, you know, every time you step in a car, you know, you have to be Krishna conscious because it may be the last time you step into a car. And, you know, that happens all the time. I mean, even to, like, you know, big disciples of Srila Prabhupada, big swamis, you know, leaving a holy place. You know, it could be the last time, you know, all it takes is to drive a dozing off a little bit and running into a tree. You know, so, you know, that's the nature of this world, you know. I mean, birth, death, old age, and disease can happen any, any time, you know. They come and they go to each one of us, and we don't know when exactly. We can just be prepared. So that's why Lord Chaitanya put the emphasis on being Krishna conscious. Then everything else will be successful. Whereas if we're not Krishna conscious, and even though we're a big man in this world, we don't know where we're going at the time of death. Then what kind of success is that? Whereas if we're Krishna conscious, and even if we're a little man in this world, then everything's successful. So the emphasis is on being, you know, try to be Krishna conscious. And that's what chanting Hare Krishna is about, is to help us to remember Krishna, to think of Krishna. Krishna said, just think of me. So, you know, we can do that just by chanting Hare Krishna. He said, just think of me, become my devotee. That may be hard to become his devotee, but if I just think of him, you know, especially in the West, we may have all these philosophical things in our mind and different reservations and thoughts about God, you know. Uh, so it may be hard to be a devotee of just Krishna, but you know if we chant Hare Krishna, then that's good enough. You know God has unlimited names. Chant Hare Krishna. If you don't like Krishna's name, you know chant whatever name of God you have, so long as it's a real name of God. And then you have the Jewish people who don't want you chanting any name of God. I mean, you can't even write. They don't even write God. You know G blank D. If you look in the Old Testament, Jewish Old Testament, I mean, that's, you know, you know, so people have their different conceptions about these things, you know. Still, they wail at the wall, don't they? In their language, their Hebrew language, they go to that wailing wall and they, you know, say their prayers and wail. I mean, they have their devotions. So whatever name of God one has, then, you know, take advantage of it because Lord Chaitanya has blessed that type of sacrifice to, um, uh, for people to derive the greatest benefit, become free from birth, death, or age of disease just by chanting God's name. It is so potent, it doesn't matter what our consciousness is like in one sense. If we do it, it can deliver us. And that's been the story since time immemorial. You can go back with history after history of, you know, some debauchee 
you know, bad persons who even in a nasty way chanted God's name and somehow ever, you know, was tricked or by some sadhu or saintly person or just by providence to chant God's name and completely changed. Completely changed. You know, became a sadhu themselves. A saintly person themselves, you know, just by the power of God's name. So, you know, always think of me, become my devotee. You know, offer obeisances. What can be so difficult is considered the greatest yoga posture. I can only do so many yoga postures. I'm too unfrail, you know, I'm too brittle now, you know, just, and that, that, you know, it's just, you know, that would probably help my health if I practiced, but I, you know, so, but I practice the greatest yoga posture. All it is is bowing down and offering obeisances to the Supreme Lord. That's considered the greatest yoga practice because yoga, after all, means to link with God. So, you know, what good is it if I can perform, you know, all kinds of postures, but my consciousness isn't on God? Maybe it's just on me. Where's that going to get me? I mean, how great am I? And, and with, with the speaker, if I'm foolish enough to think that I'm God, do you think I can become God by just thinking I'm God? If I'm God, then, hey, do something for me. <laughs> God probably can't even loan me a few hundred dollars, you know? And that's God? So, but the greatest yoga posture is actually to bow down to God and offer your humble obeisances. Oh, God, uh, I'm suffering my lot in this world, but I'm just going to go on remembering you. And then one life will change. Or Krishna says also to wash it. You know, so let people wash it the way that they wash it, but wash it God, you know. So we, you know, there's nothing wrong with our way of worship. You know, just because people in the West, you know, you know, they, they don't understand and they think you're worshiping some idol, some statue, you know, and they're going to condemn you for that. I mean, they've been condemning Hindu people for that for a thousand years. But it's a beautiful way of worship. That's all it is. A beautiful way of worship. Why can't God appear in his picture? Why? He's already in the picture. He's already in every atom. He's already everywhere. So why can't you worship a picture of God? People honor their family pictures. The guy ceased, deceased and gone. Still, you'd be offended if anybody, you know, did something to the picture on purpose, defiled it. That's my grandfather. What do you think you're doing? So why can't Krishna appear in his deity for his devotees to worship? Why can't he enjoy them cooking for him? Why? He's God. He can do what he wants. People have worshipped like this longer than any other type of worship in the history of humanity. So who has the right to just condemn it? Because what they think Abraham said. <coughs> so what if Abraham even said it? Then worship the way you want to worship. Abraham didn't say to go around and destroy the other form of worship and to kill the people and, you know, and all this sort of stuff. He didn't say that. He just said, don't worship some idol. But what is an idol? An idol is when it's nothing but a statue. Just like the famous example in the Bible of the, of the Jewish, the Hebrew people making the golden calf. Well, that's not Krishna. They were worshiping some golden calf. You know, but, you know, deity worships a science. You know, the deity, Wala has to construct the deity according to the Shastra, the scripture. There's all sorts of mantras and rituals that are done to ask Krishna to appear. And when he appears, then he has to be taken care of in a certain way. Otherwise, he can leave when he wants to leave. And for whoever comes and sees him, he can be a statue if he wants. Or he can be Krishna if he wants. So if one's not devoted, they can't see him. So it's a beautiful way of worship. It's just a way of worship. Krishna says, worship me. Why? Why would God say, worship me? 
because people derive benefit from worshiping God. You know, those who worship God derive benefit. They gain piety, they gain auspiciousness, they gain good qualities, they become godly themselves just by worshiping God. Any fool and rascal can do that if they just follow their guru. You know, whereas if we don't worship God, we ignore God. What to speak about if we become blasphemous to a God, God, you know, God this, God that, you know. If there's a God, then let him do something. Otherwise, I just think it's a joke, you know. You know, you know God doesn't care, but, you know, that person's not gaining any benefit that God could give. God can give unlimited benefit to each and every one of his uh, creatures, his uh, souls that emanate from him. It all emanates from him. And he can, he can, he can, he can make out everyone's life bright. You know, it just requires some faith. So, I'm going to end on that note. It's getting uh, pretty late. Sorry for keeping y'all so long. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Rama. Hare Krishna. Thank you.